the United States continues to significantly increase its deployment of military forces in the region, including an accelerated timeline for the arrival of the aircraft carrier Abram Lincoln. Meanwhile, the IDF continues to pound the Iranian-backed Hezbollah terrorist organization in Lebanon from the air and from the ground. The IDF also launched strikes at terrorist positions in southern Syria over the past 24 hours, while also continuing to battle Hamas in the Gaza Strip, while Hamas announces that it is refusing to participate in the decisive round of negotiations on the hostage deal on Thursday. Let's dive into the details. I'm Yair Pinto, and this is your Boots on the Ground report about what is happening in Israel on the 311th day of the war against Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and all its terror proxies in Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. In the last 24 hours, the Pentagon announced that United States Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke with Defense Minister Yoav Gallant and told him that he had ordered the ballistic missile submarine U.S. Georgia to be sent to the Middle East. Austin also ordered the USS Abram Lincoln carrier, the battle group, which includes the carrier itself, as well as several escorting vessels, which are equipped with air defense systems and attack capabilities to accelerate its arrival to this region. In a highly unusual step, a post on the Pentagon's social media platforms revealed that the USS Georgia was already in the Mediterranean Sea in July. As the location of ballistic missile submarines is usually a very close guarded secret, this step is likely a signal meant to deter Iran. As previously reported, the United States has already dispatched additional aircraft to the region, including F-22 Raptors, fully armed F-18s from the USS Theodore Roosevelt Air Wing have also been sent to bases in Jordan to be available for immediate deployment. These are just a few of the steps that America is taking in order to deter Iran from attacking and be ready to deal with an attack if Iran is not deterred. It is important to mention in this context that during the Iranian attack on Israel between April 13 and 14, more than 300 missiles and UEVs were launched from a multitude of directions. The American forces reportedly intercepted 80 of the UAVs while other Allied forces intercepted many more. This made it easier for the Israeli air defense systems to concentrate on incoming ballistic missiles which were capable of inflicting terrible damage if they managed to penetrate the defenses of Israel. IDF spokesman Rear Admiral Daniel Agari announced on Sunday evening that despite the reports that Iran has decided to carry out an attack against Israel, there is no change in the instructions given to the public at this stage. He further clarified the situation by saying, following the latest publications regarding Iran's plans, we clarify that the IDF and the security establishment are following our enemies and the developments in the Middle East, with an emphasis on Iran and Hezbollah and are constantly assessing this situation. IDF forces are deployed and prepared at a high level of readiness. So here at TBN Israel, we will continue to update you on any developments. So stay tuned to the truth by staying tuned to this YouTube channel. We also provide real-time updates on our favorite social media channels. So just do a search for TBN Israel on all these channels and subscribe to us everywhere. Switching our focus to Israel's northern border, air raid alarms were sounded Sunday evening in the community of Nariya as the Iranian-backed Hezbollah terrorist organization launched a barrage of 30 rockets at that city. Most of these rockets were intercepted with a few landing in open areas and there were no casualties reported from this attack. Also on Sunday, an anti-tank missile was fired from the Lebanese territory at a residence in Natua where one person was injured and the house was heavily damaged. Launches were also carried out at IDF positions in Mount Dov, but they fell in open areas. All day on Sunday, IDF forces attacked Hezbollah positions and military buildings in the El Adisa area in southern Lebanon. The sources of the rocket launches were also hit with airstrikes and artillery. At the same time, Two known members of Hezbollah's Radwan force were attacked by an Israeli drone as they rode on a motorcycle in the village of El Taibe in southern Lebanon, leading to their elimination. In addition, 
fighter jets attacked a military structure in the Darda region, which resulted in secondary explosions indicating that the building had been used to store ammunition and bombs. Also, military buildings used by Hezbollah were attacked in the areas of Kfarkila, El Jibin, El Adesa. Further to the northeast, it was reported in Arab media portals that airstrikes in Syria resulted in the deaths of six members of an Iranian-sponsored militia there. The strikes hit a vehicle near the city of El Buhmal, located in eastern Syria, near the border with Iraq. It is important to remember amidst all this activity that Israel has been on high alert in all sectors for over a week following the assassination of Faoud Shukar, Hezbollah's chief of staff in Beirut last week, and Hamas political bureau chief Ismail Ania in Tehran a few hours later. So please continue to spread the truth, take an active part and support us through the link that you see at the bottom of this screen, and we will create more videos like this one. Please donate to us through our website at www.tbn.org Israel. Switching our focus once again to the Gaza Strip. This week, three different divisions are fighting in three different areas. Division 98 is fighting in the Khan Yunus area in the south of the Gaza Strip. Division 252, our reserve division, is fighting in the area of the Netzer Corridor in the center of the Gaza Strip, and Division 162 manages the fighting in the Rafah area, the city of terror on the Egypt-Gaza border. The IDF spokesperson's office announced late Sunday that due to the exploitation of humanitarian zones for terrorist activities and the firing of anti-aircraft missiles at the State of Israel from al Jalla neighborhood in Khan Yunis, the conditions for the IDF troops in this area have been degraded. This makes it necessary to adjust tactics and day-to-day -day procedures for the soldiers operating in this area. IDF intelligence has assessed that Hamas is making regular use of humanitarian safe zones in Khan Yunis to store weapons, plan military operations, and even fire on IDF troops from within these safe zones. In light of this assessment, the IDF will be taking measures to reduce the risk to the civilian population of Khan Yunis. Meanwhile, fierce fighting continues in Rafah, the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip. Incredibly, Hamas continues to fire rockets into Israel from within this city, and there are also terrorists continuing to use the terror tunnels network that Hamas dug between Gaza and Egypt to pop out and attack IDF troops. Throughout the Gaza Strip on Sunday, there were about 30 airstrikes against Hamas weapons depots, military buildings, and anti-tank missile firing positions. In the last 48 hours, Division 162 reported the elimination of over 30 terrorists and the destruction of dozens of terrorist infrastructures, including several tunnels and underground bunkers that were mapped and searched for intelligence before they were demolished. The Nahal Brigade is fighting in the Tel Sultan area, where the Givati Brigade is fighting in South Rafah. It is important to understand that what is currently happening in the Gaza Strip is a maximum effort by the IDF to increase pressure on Hamas as part of the negotiations which are scheduled to take place later this week. These negotiations are meant to return Israel's remaining hostages and lead to a long-term ceasefire. Hamas is also trying to increase pressure on Israel through other means, including by trying to cast blame on Israel in the international media by saying that Israel is committing a genocide and war crimes and so forth. These efforts are having some success and Israel certainly is facing increased diplomatic pressure to agree to a ceasefire even without receiving any guarantees that the hostages will be released. However, it is beyond doubt that Hamas has been utterly defeated on the battlefield, suffering the loss of an estimated 75% of the fighters that they had at the beginning of the war, including most of their field commanders and senior leadership. They have also lost the majority of the weapons and ammunition that they had acquired to fight against Israel, and most of the tunnel networks that they dug underneath the Gaza Strip and the smuggling tunnels they dug underneath the border with Egypt. Dozens of weapons, production workshops, and underground factories have also been destroyed, along with hundreds of above-ground buildings and other infrastructure all over the Gaza Strip. 
After 10 months, the Hamas fighters are tired and they're finding it impossible to continue hiding in tunnels. Reports indicate that every day, more and more are emerging from these tunnels to either go down fighting or surrender to IDF troops. Others emerge from the tunnels to try and find a place to hide and continue fighting in the above ground buildings or even in the rubble destroyed neighborhoods. This is the reason why Colonel Avichai Aderi, the IDF spokesman in Arabic, has been asking every morning for the past few days for more and more residents in the neighborhoods of Rafah, Khan Yunus, and the central camps to move to new shelter areas. The IDF is now using its full power to continue dismantling Hamas. Still, Hamas is trying to find some way to be able to declare that this is a victory for the organization so that it can tell its supporters that it was all worth it. In fact, on Sunday evening, Hamas announced that it has decided not to participate in the August 15 round of negotiations organized by the United States, Qatar and Egypt. In a statement it published, Hamas claimed that since the beginning of the war in Gaza, it had worked for the success of the mediation efforts to reach a ceasefire and a prisoner exchange deal and conducted itself in a positive manner during the negotiations. It is difficult to know if Hamas expects anyone to believe this utterly absurd falsehood, but in any case, we do not give a platform to Hamas and their psychological warfare. Therefore, we will not publish their response. Some analysts observe that this might be a tactical move in preparation for a possible attack by Iran and Hezbollah and in order to try and obtain better terms for the negotiations that will eventually lead to the end of this conflict. However, an Israeli official said, if Hamas does not come to the table, we will continue to crush their forces in Gaza. That's why it's so important to continue and spreading the truth. You can help us to do that by subscribing to this YouTube channel and sharing our videos on social media. Share our content and click the follow button so that together we can share the truth with anyone who wants to know what is happening here. I want to conclude by paying my last respects to a hero who fell defending the state of Israel. The IDF spokesman allowed it to be published on Monday morning that Sergeant Omar Ginsburg, 19 years of age from Kiryat Tivon, a fighter in the 101st Battalion of the Parachute Brigade was killed yesterday in a battle in the southern Gaza Strip. Ginsburg was killed in a battle in the area of Khan Yunus during the raid of Division 98 on terrorist targets in that city. Please pray for the safety of the IDF soldiers and all of our allies that are fighting in this region. Please pray for all the civilians that are affected on this conflict on both sides. Please pray for God's peace to reign in our hearts. And please keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Hello, this is Mati here in Jerusalem with TBN Israel. This is Yair Pinto from TBN Israel here in Jerusalem. TBN Israel is keeping viewers informed with Israel-focused news, culture, and what God is doing in this land. Support TBN Israel today online at tbn.org Israel. Thank you.